Welcome back. Today we're going to be reviewing the Pair Gear 40 amp portable electric vehicle charger. Now this guy will deliver up to 9.6 kilowatt to your electric vehicle and as you can see it's portable but you could also use it as a permanently mounted charger in your garage because it comes with a nice dock to hang it on the wall. Before we jump into our full review, don't forget, please smash that subscribe button so you don't miss any upcoming electric vehicle news and reviews here on State of Charge. This video is powered by QMerit, North America's leading provider of installation services for electric vehicle charging, home energy storage, and other electrification technologies. See how QMerit is making the energy transition easy for home and business owners by following the link in the description of this video. Before we open this up to see exactly what Paragear gives you along with the unit, let's take a look at its key features. The body of the unit is nice and compact. It's nine inches tall by four inches wide by two inches deep. Inside the carrying case though, with the cable and everything, it measures 15.3 inches by 15.3 inches by 5.5 inches. It weighs in total 15.44 pounds. It's a 40 amp unit, which can deliver up to 9.6 kilowatt, and it comes with a NEMA 1450 plug. However, it can also charge on level one, but you have to purchase a NEMA 515 to 1450 adapter in order to be able to do so. It is Wi-Fi connected, and it has a 25 foot cable standard. It has a 2.4 inch color display screen. It uses the industry standard J1772 connector. It has an IP67 rated enclosure. The operating temperature is negative four degrees Fahrenheit to 122 degrees Fahrenheit. Now that's negative 20 Celsius to 50 Celsius. Most of the charging equipment we test here is rated to negative 20 degrees Fahrenheit. So this actually isn't as great of a cold weather rating as we typically see. It is not safety certified. It comes with a one year warranty and it's made in China. Okay, let's open her up and see exactly what comes included with the unit. All right, well, we have the body of the unit and it has a NEMA 1450 plug. Here's the connector and it has a rubber connector cover, nice 25 foot long cable. Over here, I have the connector holster. That's a remote connector holster. This is the cradle that you mount the unit to the wall. It comes with a user manual and there's also two sets of four screws with drywall anchors to mount both the cradle and the connector holster. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, some people may elect to keep this as a portable unit in the carrying case in their vehicle in case they need to charge on the road. Others will mount it in their garage and just use it as their daily charger. So let's take a quick look at how it mounts. So here's the cradle that the body of the unit slides into. So you mount this on the wall. It comes with four pre-drilled holes. You might notice there's two more drilled holes in the middle. I just did those because of the way I mount the units here on this slot wall, I have brackets that I need to mount this onto, but you wouldn't need to do that. I mean, you could also drill whole extra holes if you wanted to, but uh, it comes with these four holes and they supply the four screws with drywall anchors for the cradle as well as the connector holster. There's uh, a bag there with four screws and anchors in there. We'll talk about that next. So this basically will get mounted on the wall here. You have to make sure you locate it in a position where you'll be able to plug into your NEMA 1450 outlet. Now, this um, cable here looks like it's somewhere close to two feet long. Maybe it's about 20 inches and it's a thick cable that's hard to bend. So you wanna make sure you uh, have your outlet installed and you know exactly how you're gonna plug this in. If you install it uh, with the ground up, if you install your outlet with the ground up, the unit's gonna hang below your outlet. But if you install it with ground down, you can plug the unit in here and then have the uh, charger in a cradle kind of right next to the outlet. I think that's a little bit of a nicer installation rather than to have it here. Otherwise you're gonna to have to 
have your uh, NEMA 1450 outlet pretty high, you don't want the body of the unit way down by the ground. So um, if I were to have this installed, I would make my NEMA 1450 outlet ground up and then have it installed so, so, something like this. So um, we'll take a look at it once I hang it on the wall, which I'm gonna do next. So that's how you mount the, the uh, cradle for the body. For the connector holster, this is the connector holster, has a little bit of a tab on the top so you can wrap the, uh, the cable around it. This will get mounted on the wall like this. There's three holes way down deep <laughs> through the base of this connector holster. It's gonna be a little tricky to, uh, to screw the screws in. Uh, you know, you're probably gonna to have to get a long screwdriver or have an extension for your cordless drill to uh, screw that in. I mean, it's not anything that difficult, but it's way down at the end of this, uh, the connector holster. It's a couple of inches, maybe three inches deep. So basically that's what you would mount this on the wall, pre-drill it and then screw it in. As, as always, when I talk about installing electric vehicle charging equipment, I really recommend you um, finding studs to mount this on rather than using the drywall anchors because I've seen a lot of pictures of, of the charging equipment just kind of ripped off the wall. It's heavy with the cable and everything and then if somebody trips over it, it'll easily pull it off the wall if you don't land it on a nice stud. So, um, well, let's look at that now. Let us uh, let me install this up on the wall and we'll take a look at how the unit looks when, once it's mounted. All right, so it's all mounted up on the wall. When you first mount the bracket to the wall, the unit slides into the top of it and it locks securely into place. Here's the connector holster. You notice there's a tab on the top here that you can wrap the cable around so it doesn't fall off. And speaking of which, cable is a very thick cable. We measured it at 21 millimeters thick, making it one of the thickest cables we've ever tested here. Now that's probably good for durability. It feels like it's a really tough cable. You could run over it with your car and not have to worry about it. But I'm worried about this in the cold weather test, which we're gonna do next. I have a feeling this thick, tough cable isn't gonna perform that well in cold weather, but we'll find out soon. Um, another thing I noticed, the way the connector snaps into the holster, it really sticks out horizontally far off of the wall, probably about 16 inches, which may be difficult if you have a tight garage and you need to walk past this to get through if your garage isn't wide between the, the connector and your car, you might not have enough space. Most of these connector holsters holster the connector on an angle so it doesn't stick out of the wall quite as much. This kind of goes out you know, nearly perpendicular with the floor. So it does take up a little bit more space. I wish that was angled a little bit more. Other than that though, the connector holster is fine. Now you take a look at the body of the unit here, you'll see that there is a blue ring around the display screen. Once you plug in a vehicle, that will turn green if it's on delayed charging. If it's connected to the vehicle and not charging, it'll be solid green. But if it is actively charging, the green blinks. And then of course there's red, if there's some kind of a fault, this will light up in red. So you've got blue, you've got green solid for connected but not charging, green blinking for charging, and red for a fault. You can also change the output amperage by pressing this A button here. The default is 40 amps, but if you press it once, it drops down to 10 amp output, twice 16 amps, three times 24 amps, then 32 amps, and then 40 amps. So it will have five different amperage settings if you wanna charge your EV at a lower rate. But you don't have to worry about setting that. Like let's say if your EV can only accept 32 amps, you don't have to set it to 32 amps. It can be set at the 40 amps and it will automatically only deliver 32 amps. That's the way all electric vehicles work. The EV dictates how much power it will take in. It will ask for the maximum power that it can accept. So you never have to worry about plugging into a charger that is say more powerful than what your car can accept. It, the car won't take in more power than what it safely can. So you don't have to worry about setting that. You'd only wanna do that if you purposely wanted to charge the EV slower, which some people do. Now notice it does have the J1772 connector. This will charge any electric vehicle made in North America, even Tesla vehicles, even though Tesla uses a different connector, Tesla uses their uh, the Tesla connector, as you see here, it's different, but no problem because 
all Tesla vehicles come standard with an adapter that snaps onto the J1772, allowing you to charge your Tesla with a non-Tesla charger. So uh, this unit here will charge any electric vehicle sold in North America at a maximum of 40 amps. One of the things I noticed on the Pergear's website was that it states that the connector can open a Tesla charge port by pressing the button here on top of the connector. Now, Tesla vehicles have an automatic charge port that open up when the Tesla connector approaches it and you press the button. Have one of the Tesla connectors here and you press this little button right here as you approach the, the charge port and it opens up so you can plug it in. It's actually a really convenient feature to have. Only Tesla has that where the connector itself can operate the charge port door to open and close it. So I tested it out on my friend's Tesla when he had it here and I was testing to make sure that it was compatible with this unit. And unfortunately, it didn't work. I tried it multiple times and then I pulled out my Tesla connector just to make sure his charge port worked and it does. So um, I'm not sure exactly why, but it doesn't open the charge port door as it states on the website that it will. Let me cut in with an update. So I reported to Pergear that the connector didn't open the Tesla charge port door as it states it does on the website. And they replied that, yeah, they know that feature doesn't work yet and that they'll remove it from the website. So I checked the next day and yes, they removed that graphic from the website and they no longer promote that it will automatically open the Tesla charge door. Now, I've been using the Per Gear for the past couple of weeks to charge my Ford F-150 Lightning, my Rivian R1T, and also my friend's Tesla Model 3. And it's worked flawlessly. There's been no issues. It delivers the full 9.6 kilowatt. I've also derated it down to the lower amperage to test that out, and it works fine. It will deliver what you set it at. We also did the automatic restart test with all three vehicles, and in all three instances, the unit restarted charging as it should right after a power failure. What I do in that test is plug the charger into the vehicle and then shut off the circuit breaker to simulate a power outage. I then turn the circuit breaker back on and see if the unit will initiate charging again. Some units don't. What they'll do is they'll stay in a fault state and won't charge the electric vehicle. That's a problem because if you have a, a temporary power outage overnight, you'll wake up in the morning and the vehicle won't be charged. But the Pergear worked perfectly on all three vehicles and as soon as power was restored, it immediately began charging the electric vehicles again. So that's a pass for the automatic restart text. Next up, let's take a look at the cable deep freeze test. Well, it's time for the cable deep freeze test. I put the pair gear in this commercial freezer 24 hours ago. Now this isn't any regular freezer, this is a commercial freezer. It gets really cold, it gets well below negative 10 degrees Fahrenheit. We do this test to see how well the cable performs in cold weather applications. Some people need to charge their EVs outdoors. If you live in one of the northern states in the winter, it gets very cold. You wanna make sure the cable is flexible enough even when it's very cold, so coiling it up isn't a hassle. Some cables perform very well and some remain frozen stiff when they get really cold. So let's see how this cable performs. First, we're gonna take a look and see exactly how cold it is in the freezer. It's negative 11.5 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's pretty cold in there. All right, let me take the unit out now and we'll see how she does. If you notice, I always coil the cables up in these tight loops. Then I'll see how easy it is to uncoil it and coil it back up in large loops. Okay, initial impressions are it's not going to perform all that well. Um, it feels like it's gonna be frozen in these small coils and not wanna conform, but let's see how it does. I'm going to attempt to put it on the wall. I think that attempt is gonna be futile. 
See how this is coiling up? Look at that. It's like a spring. That is not what you want to see. You really want to see the cable return to its natural form and not be so stiff and coiled like this. I mean, I'm not even going to be able to hang this on the wall, I don't think. Let's try. Okay, I was able to. Now, geez. Okay, this is gonna be a major fail, not just a minor fail, because you can hear it cracking, and it does not wanna comply at all. I mean, <laughs> look at that. See, Imagine your car was parked outside overnight and it got really cold down below zero, which happens frequently in the northern states. And now you come out, you unplug your car and you want to coil it back up over your connector holster. So you want the cable to drape. <laughs> you don't want it to do that. So um, this cable would be very difficult to work with in the northern states in the winter if you have an outside application. Now you have to understand, for a lot of people that's not gonna be the case. Even people that live in the northern states, many people charge their EVs inside a garage. The garage, while it might be colder, it might not be as cold as it is outside. And some people do have heated garages. If you live in Southern California or one of the southern states and it never gets colder than you know, 30 degrees, this wouldn't be a problem. But we do this test for the people that live in the northern states and it's an important test because having to deal with a charger like this, a cable like this on a regular basis is going to be a bear in the winter. Okay, so that was the cable deep freeze test. It's an obvious failure. Next up, we're going to do the connector drop test. While the connector is still cold, we drop it on the floor five times and we see if it holds up for repeated drops because let's face it, you're going to drop your connector every now and then and you want to make sure it's robust enough where it won't just break immediately when you drop it. So let's give it a try. The fact that the cable is so stiff is going to make it a little hard for me to drop it properly. Little higher for this one. All right. So seemed like it weathered the drop test just fine. Let me inspect you. Yeah, no cracks or anything. Uh, the connector that they use here is very plasticky connector. It does have some ridges here for your fingers to, to grab, but there's no rubberized grip. We like to see uh, rubberized grips. It just feels better, especially when it's cold. It does have a nice rubber cap, which is a really thick cap that really protects the pins. You want to use this, uh, especially if you're not going to holster the connector. If you're going to holster the connector and your connector holster, the pins will be protected. But some people just like to drape the connector over the connector holster and not holster it or maybe not use the connector holster. If you don't, if you don't use that, you want to put the cap on your connector because it's going to protect the pins. You don't want uh, dust any type of airborne contaminants, moisture to get in there because over the years it will foul the pins and the connector will need to be replaced. So, okay, as far as the uh, cable deep freeze test and the connector drop test, we have a fail for the cable deep freeze test and a pass on the connector drop test. The Paragare P2 is not a smart charger, but it is Wi-Fi enabled. The way it works is the unit actually sends out a Wi-Fi signal. You then join the network with your smartphone, tablet, or computer, and you scan a QR code that's in the instruction manual, which takes you to an IP address where you can monitor your charging, set the amperage, or set a delayed charge time. But it doesn't really provide any useful charging data as most smart chargers do. And since it's not internet-based, you have to be very close to the unit in order to get its signal. You have to be able to reach the Wi-Fi signal sent out. 
And since it doesn't really offer very much information, actually no more information than what the screen actually shows itself, it really isn't that worthwhile using. You might as well just use the screen. You can set the amperage, set delayed charging right from the touch screen. You can do that through the app, but I don't really know what the point would be to, to open up the app to do it there when you can just do it from the face of the screen. And since you need to be close to it, why bother opening the app? The only thing you can do from that app is turn off automatic charging. What that automatic charging is, when, as soon as you plug in your vehicle, the unit will start charging. Now, most people would have their charger set up that way if it was in a private garage. But if it's in a public area where you want to limit access to your charger, you can turn off automatic charging within the app. And then every time you plug in, you need to open up the app and turn on charging. It will restrict other people from using it and, you know, keep people from using your electricity and your charger when you're not around. But as far as I can tell, that's really the only advantage that the app has. One good feature that the Paragear P2 has is it has dual temperature controlled sensors. It has sensors inside the unit as well as inside the NEMA 1450 plug and it monitors how hot it gets. So if the temperature gets to 70 degrees Celsius, that's 158 degrees Fahrenheit, it will derate the power. It'll lower the charging rate to try to cool off the components that are overheating. And if the temperature reaches 85 degrees Celsius, which is 185 degrees Fahrenheit, it will stop charging completely. It'll shut off to prevent overheating and damage to the unit or possible fire in your NEMA 1450 outlet. So that's a good safety feature that it has within the unit as well as in the NEMA 1450 plug. I mentioned that the Paragear does allow for delayed charging, which it does. It doesn't allow you to set a schedule though, as most smart chargers will allow. You can set it for say midnight till 6 a.m. That might be when your time of use rates are low. The way this unit works is you can delay charging for up to 10 hours in one hour increments, either through the app or on the front of the screen. In order to set delayed charging on the screen, you press the clock button and each time you press it, it's going to delay charging for one hour up to 10 hours. Uh, but you do have to do this every time you use the unit. It's not going to hold any type of charging schedule. And as I said, most people like to have a schedule a specific time, say midnight. The way this works is it'll only delay it for a set amount of hours. You can't set midnight or 1 a.m. Or, or you know 9 p.m. Whenever your time of use schedule lowers the electric rates is typically when people want to start their delayed charging schedule. You can't do that with the Paragear P2. The unit is also a dual voltage unit. And what I mean by that is it can charge from either a 120 volt source or a 240 volt source. Now, it comes with a NEMA 1450 plug tethered to it. So you can't remove that. Many of these dual voltage chargers have adapters that you pull out and you snap in either the 120 volt adapter or the 240 volt adapter. It's not the case with the Paragear. This unit comes with NEMA 1450 only. And if you want to charge from a 120 volt source, you need to buy an adapter. Uh, and that adapter would be a NEMA 515P to NEMA 1450R. They're readily available on sites like Amazon, but you have to be careful. You have to buy the right one. You need to buy one that specifically says for EV charging. Most of them are made for RV use and they won't work. And I learned the hard way. I went and ordered one to use the, for this review and it didn't work. And then upon further uh, investigation, I realized I need to buy one that specifically says for EV charging. So I went and ordered the other one. They're not that expensive. I paid like $20, I think, for it. And uh, it worked just fine with that. And when you use the unit with the uh, NEMA 515 plug adapter on a 120 volt circuit, you're gonna get a little more than one kilowatt delivered to the unit. You know, that's slow charging but uh, it works. And in some instances, level one charging works just fine, especially when you're on the road, you might go somewhere, you're gonna be there for a long time. Uh, I know people that uh, 
go to uh, you know weekend rentals and they drive a long distance and when they get there, their vehicle basically sits there for two days. You could plug into our 120 volt outlet and have your uh, EV fully charged for the trip home. So there are reasons why you'd wanna have the 120 volt adapter. The unfortunate thing is the Paragard doesn't include it with the unit. Most of these dual voltage portable chargers have the uh, adapters for both 240 volt charging and 120 volt charging included. Doesn't come with this. You've got to go out and buy the adapter. And when you do, make sure it says for EV charging. Okay, so the last test that we do with these portable EV chargers is the submersion test. Now we only do that when they are rated to be waterproof. The Paragear P2 has an IP67 rating. We talked about that earlier when we did the key features. IP67 means the unit is waterproof for up to 30 minutes in as deep as one meter of water. That's about three feet of water for 30 minutes an IP67 rated device should be able to function fine without having any water intrusion into the unit. Now we do review other units here that are IP65 or IP66 rated. Those units are just water resistant. So when I review those units, I might just spray them with a garden hose to represent driving rain. But the units that are IP67 rated, I submerge them in a bucket of water for up to 30 minutes just to make sure that they work. So I did that with the Paragear P2. I filled up a bucket of water and I lowered the unit into the bucket of water. I submerged it in about uh, four or five inches of water, not the three feet of water that you could. And I was preparing to leave it there for about 30 minutes. Unfortunately, after roughly 10 seconds of being submerged, the red light came on and the unit failed. So I removed it from the bucket and I could see that what the problem was. Water was pouring out of the base of the unit where the cable goes into the body of the unit. The connection there failed. It has a very poor connection. I don't know if there was something wrong with this specific unit because uh, this unit as it is constructed would not pass IP67 rating because the cable that goes into the, the body of the unit isn't sealed. You can pull it right out with, with not a hard pull at all. If you just bend it hard, that you can see the wires get exposed and that's where water's gonna go into the body of the unit. So I fried the unit, this thing's done. You can see, I don't have it plugged in here anymore. You can probably see the water droplets inside the, um, the display screen. And uh, so the review is over, <laughs> but uh, that's, I planned this for the last test just in case there was a problem. Uh, I always do the, uh, the connector drop and uh, cable deep freeze test and a submersion test last, just in case the unit fails on one of those tests. At least I've been able to use it for a couple of weeks and do the full review. So unfortunately, it failed the submersion test. I would not recommend using this in uh, inclement weather or leaving it outside, say lying on the ground if it's raining. Uh, it should be able to do that. IP67 is waterproof, not water resistant. So this should not have happened. And uh, you know it's gonna reflect in the scoring when we score the unit, which is next. So next up, let's go to the charger rater and see how the Paragear P2 fared in our points-based rating system. First up, we'll look at the cost and value category. It's gonna get three points because it costs less than $400. It actually costs less than $300. Right now you can buy this unit for $299, which is a very good price. Okay, value-wise, I'm gonna say it's good. So it's gonna get an extra point there. It's gonna finish up the cost and value category with a total of 19 points. Next up, we'll take a look at power and weatherproof rating. The maximum charging power is 40 amps, so it doesn't get any points there. 40 amps is our baseline. If you have more power, you get more points, less power, less points. Adjustable power, it does have adjustable power. You do it on the front of the display as I showed you earlier, so it gets a point for that. Weatherproof rating. So I'm gonna give it the two points here because it is rated at higher than NEMA 4, it's the IP67 rating. Now, as you could see in the review, I don't know how they pulled off an IP67 rating because this unit 
easily allowed water to uh, intrude into the body of the unit, which it's not supposed to. So not really sure what happened there. I'm going to give it the two points here, but it's going to cost it later. Uh, Energy Star certified. No, it's not. Automatic restart. Yes, it did that. You saw that in the video. So it's going to finish up the power and weatherproof rating category with 19 points. Okay, now for construction and durability the connector and holster. It's not gonna get any points for that. It passed our connector drop test. The remote connector holster isn't a great one. It's not a terrible one. So I'm not gonna give it a poor rating on that. So it's gonna get no points. It's not gonna lose points either. Cable length, it's a 25 foot, nice, long, thick cable. So it's gonna get two extra points. For cable pliability, as you saw, it performed very poorly in our cable deep freeze test. So it's gonna lose a point for that. Okay, robust construction, below average. Uh, this unit here is not made well, as you can see. Um, if you just tug on the, the cable, it pulls out of the body of the unit and it allows water to get into the unit. So it's gonna lose two points there. Removability, uh, it's a simple unit to pull out of this dock, so it's gonna get no points. It's not gonna lose points. Ease of installation, very easy to install, no points there. So it's gonna get a total of 14 points for construction and durability. Smart, non-smart, this is not a smart charger. Yes, there is an app that you can pair with it as long as you're close to the unit. It's not a web-based app, so you can't have remote starting and stopping. You basically have to be you know, close enough to have your Wi-Fi signal attach, uh, connect to your phone uh, to able to use it. And even once you do that, there's not a lot of features in the app. There's not uh, a lot of things it can do. It can start and stop a session. You can uh, set some delayed uh, charging time, but you can also do that right on the face of the unit. And uh, if you're close enough to the charger to have a Wi-Fi signal connected, you might as well just do it on the face of the unit. So there's not a lot of functions there with this. Um, so it's not gonna get any points for that. It does not power share. It's not compatible with Alexa or a Google Assistant. It does not have extensive charging uh, record data. So it's not gonna get a point. It's not OCPP compliant. No points at all in that category. It ends with 15 points, which is the baseline where all the categories start. Safety certified and warranty. The unit is not safety certified. There are components of this charger, like the cable, I think the connector, that are safety certified, but as a whole, the unit is not safety certified. Now, Paragear told me that they are in the process of having the unit safety certified, but it isn't as of today, so it's gonna lose five points. We, we, we penalize these chargers a lot when they're not safety certified. Okay, next up is warranty. You get one point for every year warranty you have. It only gets one point because this unit only has a one year warranty. We typically don't recommend units here on State of Charge unless they have at least a two year warranty, preferably a three year warranty. Three year is pretty much the norm in this industry for high quality, well-made units. This only has a one year warranty. It tells you a little bit about the confidence that the manufacturer has in the unit lasting a long time. So that ends up with 11 points for the safety certified and warranty category, giving the Paragear P2 a total of 78 points in our charger rater. Now, when we convert that to a rating based on five stars, it ends up with 3.9 stars out of five. And as always, I add my own personal rating, and then we average that with the charger rater for the final score. I'm gonna give the Paragear P2 a rating of 2.5 stars out of five. I can't look past the fact that it had a major failure in our submergent test. The cable deep freeze test was also a failure, but we see a lot of these chargers have poor cables. There's not a lot of good cables on the market these days. Some of them are very good, like the ChargePoint Home Flex, for instance, has an outstanding cable, but most of the units we see today are failing the cable deep freeze test. But they don't fail a test where they allow water to come in and the cable on the top shouldn't just pull out of the unit with, without a lot of force. That's a major fail and it's a safety issue. So I really can't look past that. I liked the unit up until that point because it actually seemed like it was working well. I used it for a few weeks, it was charging my cars. I like the fact that it has this nice display screen. I love it when these portable units have those, but you know we've had some failures on it now and unfortunately it's gonna hurt it in the scoring. 
Okay, so when we average the Charger Raider score with my personal score, we get a final score of 3.2 stars out of five. Okay, all that's left now is to take a look at my major hits and misses before we do the wrap up. Okay, on the hit side, I like the fact that it's a dual voltage unit. I like when these units can be charged from either a 120 volt or a 240 volt source, and the Paragear P2 can. I like the price. It's currently available for $299. That's a good price for a dual voltage unit like this that can deliver 40 amps. Many of these dual voltage units max out at 32 amps. So this delivering 40 amps and available for $299 is a good price. I like the fact that it has this nice display screen that shows you some good data, the line voltage, the current uh, delivery uh, in kilowatt that's going to the vehicle. I like when they have these display screens and this has one, so that's definitely a hit. Okay, now let's look at the misses. As far as the cable failing the cable deep freeze test, it failed it in miserable fashion. It was a very, very poor showing for the cable deep freeze test. I could barely straighten it out myself using all my strength. Now, it has no 120 volt adapter. I love the fact that it's a dual voltage unit, but that should be included with the unit. They should put that in the bag. Almost every dual voltage unit that I've seen so far that I've reviewed here has both adapters included with the unit. You shouldn't have to go out and buy one uh, because that's a hassle. And look at me, I bought the wrong one first, so now I had to return it and buy another one. Uh, and if you do get it, as I mentioned earlier, make sure you get one that specifically says for electric vehicle use. And finally, I have to ding it for the poor build quality. We can't have these units where if you only tug on the cable slightly, they separate from the body of the unit. You can't allow moisture and water into a unit that's supposed to be IP67 rated. Uh, that's just unexcusable. And uh, I don't know if I just got a poorly built unit here, or if this is indicative of all these units, I would assume they have the same quality control for all their units, but this had poor build quality, and unfortunately, it led to a catastrophic failure, and this unit can't be used anymore. All right, well, that's it for our Paragare P2 review video. We hope you learned a little bit about this unit here and helped you make a decision on whether you want to buy one or not. Listen, if this is your first time here at State of Charge, please smash that subscribe button, ring the notification bell, and while you're at it, give me a like on this video. And as always, thanks for watching.